Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another live session at the Reactors. My name is Rav, and I'm the program manager here at Reactor London. Before we get into the session, please take a moment to read our code of conduct. We are all here to learn, so please be respectful. Please be kind. Um, ask a lot of good questions. The chat will be open throughout, and we do encourage you all to participate. Today, we we're having a session with Alan, and he's going to be talking all about Inside GPT Large Language Models Demystified. And with that, I will now bring him up on the stage, and he will take over. Um, hi, Alan. Hi. Great. So um, welcome to my session on uh, Inside GPT Large Language Models uh, Demystified. And what I'm going to attempt to do in this session is, is run through a bit of the maths and a bit of the mechanics of what goes on inside uh, large language models uh, when they're processing text. This is about the fourth time I'm delivering this session, uh, and it tends to get a bit deeper uh, every uh, every session because I'm, I'm learning more about what goes on inside these uh, these models. So um, I'm also uh, checking out the chat, so please interrupt me with questions uh, if you would like um, to know anything more or you'd like me to explain anything more in detail. Uh, I normally teach training courses, so I'm used to being uh, interrupted with questions all the time. It's great if you can uh, do that uh, for me. I will also mention my YouTube channel uh, because because I quite frequently publish stuff out on my uh, my YouTube channel. I will be recording this stuff, um, uh, th this kind of GPT theory. But I've also got some, I'm currently looking at using GPT-4 uh, to play uh, StarCraft. I've also uh, got this webcast here looking at um, using um, the Bing chat, uh, chat GPT in Bing, uh, to write a, a Python shooter game in 30 minutes. So I'm using it to generate the code and also generate all of the images uh, there. So there's um, plenty of uh, GPT related uh, stuff going on there. So a bit about myself. Um, I describe myself as a developer, trainer, mentor and evangelist. I like building things. So I've been in the IT industry since 1995, and I've tried to focus more on, you know, uh, taking a development role, uh, working with the latest development technologies rather than going into project management or architecture or at sales. I do a lot with the community. So I've been organizing the Cloud Burst Conference, the AI Burst Conference. Both of these are in, uh, in Stockholm, uh, where I'm based. Also, uh, global boot camps. I've been involved in the global Azure boot camp and the um, global AI boot camp over the years. And I travel around and speak at conferences. I also work with Coda Dojos, kids between 7 and uh, 17 uh, years old, uh, learning how to program. And for that community work, Microsoft has awarded me the AI uh, MVP award, most valuable professional. And I've also been an Azure MVP and a BizTalk MVP. Uh, I've been involved in that program since 2005. Before I start, I'd like to thank some uh, fellow YouTubers um, for you know, putting in a lot of energy and work into creating um, uh, great videos. I've used these YouTube channels to gain an understanding uh, of how these uh, these models work, uh, especially uh, Centex and uh, and StatQuest. They've been really good in in uh, going into the maths uh, behind uh, those uh, the, those models. So um, you will have heard of uh, GPT. Yeah, bam, uh, that's another StatQuest viewer uh, come up in, uh, in chat, I remember that. So uh, everybody's pretty much used GPT, you're familiar uh, with these, uh, but many people have maybe not used GPT through the API. The typical scenario is we wanna know something, so we bring up Bing, uh, Bing chat and we go in and, and we ask a question and it's able to generate uh, text and do this question answering uh, solution. For many of the customer projects that I work on, um, the customers want to chat with their own data. So instead of um, you know using the Bing search to get information from, we're using uh, the search service that we've got in Microsoft Azure, the AI search, and uh, we're um, uh, basically putting uh, an indexing documents and people can do questions with their own uh, data. Uh, we also do uh, text generation. Uh, this is a text generation example that I used at the uh, CloudBoo Cloud Brew conference in uh, Belgium, uh, in Mechelen in Belgium uh, last week. Uh, Glenn, Martin and Chris had uh, organized this at uh, this conference. And we had lots of tr uh, tr Belgian train strikes, which affected people and, uh, and speakers who are traveling to the event. So what this is doing is it's generating one of these in a world where um, movie uh, trailers uh, that you see at the movies. And what I do in the prompt for this 
is uh, this is what the prompt looks like i'm asking to generate a dramatic and uh, intro to a dramatic and exciting movie about a particular subject where a hero must battle against an evil villain in order to achieve an objective and i'm using what's called few shot generation here where i supply uh, i've got three different examples of these i, I copy pasted from the, the internet so that the model knows kind of the actual structure of what these uh, in a world where movie intros should look like. That's just one of them, but I've got another another two there. So there's uh, three of those. And then when I'm feeding this in, I specify the actual subject, which is the Cloud Brew Conference. And then the hero is Glenn, Martin and Chris. The villain is a Belgian uh, train strikes and uh, um, actual scenario what they've got to achieve their objective is to uh, deliver uh, the actual conference or, or organize the the conference so it's able to generate this text uh, from that another thing we've done uh, in a customer project is we actually um that text generation we actually use this in a customer project for generating introduction to reports based on comments that people had put put in on the website and it was able to use examples of that to generate these uh, report interests fact validation uh, this was from another customer project where when somebody had written a report, it needed to be validated against all of these various uh, policies. So what we could do is we could check with the policies and we could ask GPT, uh, does this um, report um, run, uh, you know, comply with these various policies? Um, I can't show the customer data here, uh, but I can show this example where we've got um, incorrect uh, sentences. And this has been pick picked out by GPT. And in the prompt, I asked it to use Wikipedia to verify facts uh, in the uh, verify all of the facts in the text and uh, print out any incorrect sentences. So it's able to identify that Stockholm is not the uh, capital of Finland and it was not founded in 2010 by Peter Enholm. So. Again, that, that was another customer scenario. And for these scenarios, we're using the GPT models. For both of those, we use the GPT 3.5 Turbo hosted in the Microsoft OpenAI service. We can also use it for text classification. Uh, this is a, a tweet that came out at a conference I was speaking in the Netherlands. I have no idea if this is positive or negative sentiment, but GPT uh, can actually analyze that and uh, say whether it's positive or negative sentiment. Before we had large language models, we used to use um, specifically trained models for uh, doing uh, sentiment analysis. So um, you take, you know, you go to uh, Kaggle, a website that has loads of data sets, you download this Amazon reviews data set, and that would have thousands and thousands of Amazon reviews with a text along with a number of stars uh, that they're given the review. And what you can do is you can say, well, positive, text will have five stars, negative text will have one star, and so on. So you can actually train a model to only understand how to um, score um, you know, product reviews. And also, it's only based on the specific language. It's based in English. But nowadays with GPT, we can use a general purpose language model to be able to do things like classification, where we previously spend a week training a model uh, to be able to uh, solve that type of a problem. Um, creating co-pilots as well. Um, we're working uh, with uh, Nobel, uh, the Nobel organization, and what we are kind of um, thinking about and, and exploring is that GPT has the uh, ability to be able to generate code. So if you provide GPT with a uh, pointed at give it a table structure, um, you know, the create table statement in SQL, it's able to write a SQL query uh, to get a breakdown of the number of Nobel Prize winners per country in Europe. And that's the actual SQL that it generated. Now, when you're building a co-pilot, you actually give the language model um, the opportunity to generate the code and also execute the code. So it runs that code on the database and then it's able to give an actual uh, response. So this allows us, instead of having to write a SQL query, we can write something in, in plain text, English or whatever language we choose, and it will generate the SQL code for us, execute that query, get the results, and then summarize the results in uh, the language that we'd like the output to be run to. This um, is being considered quite dangerous um, for good reasons. If you've got a company sales database and you ask GPT to improve the sales statistics for your company, it might start modifying the, um, the actual database and doing updates in the database. So we do have to be very uh, careful uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, our predictions. Um, with um you know permissions on that just from the comments gpt is notoriously known to make up facts not validate them absolutely yeah um it it, it does do uh, hallucinations and uh, we want to make sure uh, that it's uh, it's going to do that as um 
as, as much as possible. Uh, usually in the prompts, we can, um, what does it say? Austria and Hungary got forgotten another time. Is Austria not in there? Yeah, I went through and I checked this, but yeah, it's looking like it's not been 100% correct uh, for that with, uh, with selecting those various uh, various countries. Correct. Good, good observation there. Um, so when working with GPT, this is a friend of mine, Christian Weyer, uh, who was at Tecarama in Belgium. I actually made him go back a slide so I could take a photo of this. So if you're a .NET developer and wanting to work with LLMs, uh, Python uh, is the best tool uh, to use. We do have semantic kernel um that is uh, written in .NET, but my recommendation will be to pick up python look at langchain uh, because there's just so many examples uh, on the net and if you're going to be working a lot with ai and machine learning uh it's so much easier uh, to be working in python there's so many more libraries and so many so many much more uh, information uh, coming out so a bit about processing text with a large language model um when we're asking how how do i make cheese we have this kind of um, architecture of the model. And this has come from a white paper called Attention is All You Need, which was written by some Google engineers, uh, which was talking about using attention models that we'll look at in a bit more detail uh, later on uh, as an alternative to using LTSM or recurrent uh, neural uh, neural networks. And the idea is that you'll, um, you'll feed in text into the network and you'll get text out. However, there's a problem with this that neural networks don't really do text. When we say that um, you know the, the large language models understand language, what they're actually doing is they are making predictions based on sequences of tokens, which are integer values. So the models themselves never see the text that we enter. They just see the tokens that is, uh, uh, is uh, represented uh, by that. So you've probably understood a bit about text tokenization if you've worked with GPT uh, projects. It's the way that the input text is converted into tokens and the tokens are converted into the output text. So a couple of important points uh, with this, um, that the tokens are common sequences of characters found in text. And also, the, model, uh, un uh, the models understand the statistical relationship between these tokens and excel at producing the next token in a sequence of tokens. Um, two important points in, in that sentence, that the models don't understand language, they understand the statistical relationship between the tokens that make up uh, the, the uh, input text. And the only thing that the GPT models are doing is predicting the next token for a given sequence of tokens. That's the only thing uh, that a GPT model will do, just does next token prediction. So if you look at the tokens for that, uh, we can see that when we're working in English, most of the tokens are single words. We can also see uh, that most of the tokens are preceded by a space character. So instead of having space as a separate token, if there's a word, then it's uh, preceded by a space. Sometimes not. You can see that we've got a capital T with uh, the uh, appearing there. Here we've got a T with uh, a space uh, before it. And if you look at the token numbers, uh, we can see that that sentence is uh, for uh, that group of text is 45 tokens. And we can see that the is represented. It's 464 when there's no space. And then it's 382 when it's preceded by a space and has an upper character. And then when it's preceded by a space and a lower character, it's 262. And we've got 262 appearing here as well. Now, if you use a different language, uh, I'm based in Sweden, uh, so I also speak Swedish. Um, that's what that sentence is translated into Swedish, and that's how it looks tokenized in Swedish. When you're working in a non-English language, very often uh, the words are going to be um, segmented between multiple uh, tokens, and that has implications on the cost and the performance and the accuracy of the various models that we are uh, working with. And we can see that that uh, is coming out at 83 tokens, where it was um, 45 tokens in English. When I was in Mechelen, uh, there's a local dialect, uh, Mechelenian. That one comes out at 71 tokens. The worst um, kind of uh, language that uses a common um, alphabet uh, was Finnish. So that was coming out at 103 tokens. We do quote the accuracy on different languages. Uh, the large language models support multiple languages, and Telugu 
was the one that had the most uh, tokens. I think this dialect is spoken in uh, India uh, somewhere. Please comment if you do understand uh, Telugu, uh, because there is a, is a demo on that a bit later on. But that's 622 tokens, even though it's uh, 247 uh, characters, because for many of these, you've got to use more than one token to represent a particular uh, character. So this is showing the stats on, dependent on the language that we're using, how many tokens uh, it takes uh, to represent, say, um, the, the amount of tokens in English. And you can see that it goes up um, with, with many, many common languages. It's running about, um, you know, about between 1.5 and 2 point something. And then it does start to jump up uh, for languages that are less, uh, less well uh, used. And this is showing the understanding of the performance test. There's not an exact colorate correlation uh, but there's um, a kind of a fairly good correlation between um, the uh, number of tokens used to re uh, rep uh, represent uh, the words and the actual accuracy of this you can see that telugu is down here whereas english is, is up here and this not not an exact correlation but a fairly good uh, good co uh, correlation there so um, one of the things that I've heard is English is the new programming language. Even if you're not an English speaker, you should endeavor to write your prompts in English and supply as much information as you can to the models in English because it understands that uh, better. Um, GPT models are most accurate within English. They have the, the most accuracy. Also, the billing is based on the number of tokens that you're sending in and the number of tokens that are generated. So it'll be cheaper uh, to use English. Throughput is based on tokens per second. It will be faster uh, the uh, fewer tokens that you have. And many of the models, or all of the models actually, have a maximum number of input tokens. So we can only send so many tokens to the model. So that means more text if we're working with um, English. Is it possible to share the slides or blog? I'm going to record a webcast on this and put this on my uh, YouTube channel. And uh, so um, I don't normally uh, share slides because there's there's lots of code in this demo as well, and uh, which which won't be present uh, within the, within the slides. So just for an example, uh, I did I asked it how to make cheese in uh, Telugu. Uh, translated it with Google Text and fed that in, and it came out with the answer uh, there, which I translated back into English. And instead of getting a long uh, description of this. Um, it said that you can make it with cheese powder, curd, pezza, dal, jiggery, and so on. I wouldn't choose cheese powder when making cheese, but that was a very simple explanation. The model uh, then got a bit confused, uh, and it uh, offered to generate um, the characters from Frozen in uh, a myth, an enchanted... Um, in an autumn bound forest of an enchanted land. And it said uh, that you requested. So I asked it how to make cheese and it thought I requested uh, that it generate the frozen characters. I think um, something that will be improved in the future is better understanding with more languages. Uh, it, it is very um, English focused and it would be good to see uh, minority languages having better support in these large language models. And that's something uh, that I will, I, I hope there will be uh, improvements in later on. Are languages with grammatical cases producing more tokens because of additional complexity? It's more that the, um, the tokenization language is based on common sequences of text and it's been generated with mostly English text. So Swedish words, uh, they end up uh, as smaller group, groups of words because the Swedish uh, vocabulary, so, uh, Swedish um, word list uh, hasn't had that much influence in, uh, in training the tokens. There's only a certain number of tokens that you can use. I think there's about 50,000 or something uh, that are used in these, these LLMs. So uh, it does have to choose which words and it chooses the most common sequences of characters. So uh, there have been attempts to generate language-specific models in Sweden. Um, we have AI Sweden, which has produced the GPT uh, SWE algorithm. It's based on, I think, GPT-3, and it's been trained on um, the Swedish language, but also Norwegian, Danish, Icelandic, and programming uh, code. So um, that we do have a, a customer who's considering uh, using that model. You can download it from Hugging Face. You can run it on-premise uh, if, if you want to, if you have a, a big GPU. And that can then be used language-specific. But what many people are finding is that the performance of GPT-3.5 in English, if you have a language-specific one, the performance of GPT-4 is so much better 
um, for many of the languages than it would be by using a smaller model, which is specifically trained for that specific language. So if you trained GPT 3.5 in uh, Latvian, for example, you may only get 70% accuracy where GPT 4 is giving 80% accuracy in Latvian. So most people are finding that GPT 4 is probably better than a smaller model uh, which is language uh, specific and it's not really possible not really feasible to train a gpt4 model on your own language it will be too expensive uh, to to do that so um quick demo on how the uh, the actual language tokenization works i've got this iterate tokens this is a few lines of code i'm working with a gpt model uh, which i've downloaded from um i think i got this from uh, from github um, the Transformers uh, project, which uh, Hugging Face has put together. And if I set this thing as the startup project, which one of the iterate tokens, set this as the startup file and do control F5. What we'll get is the, uh, the tokens. I don't know if you heard a bell sound because um, if we look at the beginning of these, the first 256 tokens are really coming from the, uh, the kind of ASCII uh, character set. So th that means it can represent anything using using these various tokens. We've got special tokens that aren't displaying too well. And then we get into various symbols and then we get into all of the kind of word parts and, uh, and words. It tends to be that the common words are um, at the beginning. And then as we scroll down, we get to more obscure words. I'm only showing the first kind of eight or 9,000 out of, I think, I think 50,000. You can see that most of them are preceded with a space. And then you've got parts of words uh, that can be, you know, used to combine uh, words and uh, and so on. However, neural networks don't understand integers. So when you're working with machine learning, we have to be working with floating point numbers. So we have this concept of word vectorization or word embedding. And this is also related to what we call vector databases and uh, similarity searches and so on. So if you look at the word cheese, uh, this is the actual vector uh, that's used in GPT-2 to represent cheese. I think it's about 768 uh, floating point numbers. And these word vectors uh, can be used to identify similar words. We can't really think in 362 dimensions. It makes our head explode. So one good way of kind of understanding a bit about how vectorization works is to think about colors. So the color Azor is 0, uh, 0127255. So if we're using floating point values, values 0, uh, 0 0.5 and 1. And that's the way of being able to represent that color. And that means that we can find colors that are similar to the color Azor, which is out here. You can see we've got this uh, brandy is blue and we've got blue and various other colors. And you can see when we project the color values into 3D space that similar colors are close to each other. And it's the same with words when we do uh, word embedding. So we can do various things with um, color vectors. If I drop back to Visual Studio um, and select color vectorization as the startup file, So that's, um, I'm not plotting all of the colors because matplotlib is pretty slow, uh, but that's plotting a few of the colors in 3D space. So you can see that uh, colors close to each other are, um, are similar. And then you can also search for similar colors and find by looking at the nearest neighbors, the closest uh, vectors in that color space, uh, what those uh, particular uh, colors are. So it's coming out with these various colors. You can see the ones that are fairly close to the color as well, appearing, appearing there. Then you can also do sums. You can say red plus blue is equal to uh, fuchsia. And then uh, you can say azor plus autumn is equal to rich, brilliant uh, lavender. And in theory, you can do the same type of thing with um, words, with word vectorization. I haven't managed to get this to work. But um, with word to vec a lot of the, um, the webcasts have been saying, well, if you take king minus man plus woman, then you get queen. And if you take Paris minus France plus Poland, you get Warsaw. I haven't managed to find a good example that works like that when I work with the actual uh, word vectorization. The one thing that uh, we can look at is how these words are projected into, into 3D space when we do dimensionality reduction. So these are um, the words to VEC. There's 10,000 words in this, in this cloud, and they haven't been sorted yet. So what we can do is we can do a um, 
UMAP, which will basically find nearest neighbors and organize these, uh, these words into words that have the most similar vectors. So this is a projector.tensorflow.org. And you can use it with various other data sets for kind of exploring uh, the uh, kind of a meaning between, between words here. So if we go to these words, we've got chicken, meat, vegetable, dishes, pan. These are all related to cooking. And if we go over here, delta, quad, psi, we've got various things are relating to the Greek alphabet there. And then over here, we've got uh, various US states. And you can go to different areas in this and see what the actual words are. And then if we search for something like September, and we look for the, say, 15 nearest neighbors, see that we're getting a bunch of months that are appearing here uh, in this, uh, this word cloud. And they should be fairly close to each other here. That these are the ones that are related to dates and, and various things like that. So word to vec was really important in the creation of these language models that we can actually um, get a mathematical understanding of what words mean and how they how they relate to each other. It's also used in vector databases. So within the Microsoft AI search, you can now do word embedding where you can take in, uh, text, you can uh, do text embedding or vectorization, and you can find nearest neighbors and find text with a similar sentiment. You can also do that with images. And I think this is also present in the, um, the um, Azure AI search. It's also possible there to do that. And then you can also do it with songs as well. So you can find similar songs. Spotify does this. Um, they've got this um, <clears throat> project on GitHub called Spotify Annoy, which stands for Approximate, Approximate Nearest Neighbor. Oh, yeah. It's basically some really complex C++ code with Python, with Python wrapper around it. So we can actually um, do nearest neighbor predictions. And I've used this in um, the webcast on my YouTube channel. I was actually looking at using Spotify Annoy to be able to do um, nearest neighbor uh, comparisons. I don't know where that webcast is, but it's um, it's somewhere. If I drop into the videos, that webcast will be, uh, yeah, this uh, one using image similarity search. So that's really using a vector database and image embedding to be able to um, find dogs uh, that look like other dogs. And it is pretty good at being able to, uh, to do that. So what the, the large language models do is sequence a prediction. So if we feed in an input sequence, the cat sat on the, then it's able to predict the next token in that particular sequence. These can be variable length. So that's what the tokens for that sentence look like. It could be the king of rock and roll is Elvis. And then that is going to be the, um, the tokens that represent that. And what the model will do is predict what the next token in that sequence is going to be. This involves long-term dependencies, because if the cat sat on the floor, it had just been cleaned. The model needs to know what it refers to. So it had just been cleaned, and we can assume that it's going to be the floor that had just been cleaned. Whereas if the cat sat on the floor, it had just been fed. Then it had been fed. We can assume that it is referring to the cat. And with more complex text, such as uh, the boy stood on the burning deck poem, um, you can see that it's saying up on his brow, he felt their breath, and his is going to refer to the boy, which was mentioned way back here in the actual uh, sequence. So these long-term dependencies are important to understanding uh, the language sequences. Also, the order. The film, the film was not good. In fact, it was very bad compared with the film was not good. In fact, it was uh, very bad. This is uh, completely the opposite sentiment because it's the same words, but we've just swapped the ordering of those words uh, around and it's coming out with a completely different uh, meaning. So when we run this into, into a model, uh, and I'm using GPT-2 for this, we're saying the cat sat on the, and it's coming out with floor as being the most probable uh, word that's coming next in this sequence. I would have thought it would have been Matt, uh, the cat sat on the mat, because that's kind of like a, a poem. Matt wasn't listed. I think it's way down here somewhere. So there are um, a lot of tokens, about 50,000 tokens, and these are showing the most common ones. Uh, and then there's uh, another 51% uh, of the probability that can, can be any of the other, uh, other tokens appearing here. They will all have a, a very, very small uh, probability, but most of them are very, very close to zero round about uh, in this space uh, here. What it's actually doing, uh, the model is that it's actually taken in these series of, of, of tokens. It doesn't actually see the text. All the model sees is the actual tokens. And it's saying, based on these tokens, then this is going to be the next most probable uh, output there.
So if you say the king of rock and roll is Elvis, then Prez is the most popular token here, 64.89%, uh, because Presley is split into two tokens. There isn't a token to represent a Presley. It could be the king of Elvis full stop or the king of Elvis comma. Um, 2.76% chance that it could be Elvis Cost, and then it's probably going to be Elvis Costello. And then you can see all of the other ones fitting into this space here. Um, so we can run some demos on looking at the sequence prediction. If I go in and take um, GPT Fundamentals as the uh, startup project, startup file, and run that. It takes a few seconds to load the model, but you can see the cat sat on there, and we've got floor, bed, ground, edge, and then you can see all of these words here. And you can actually zoom in on this bit here, I think, and uh, and see different. Uh... Oh, we've got Matt there at 0 0.0 at four percent chance uh, that uh, appearing there. And then if I close that, and we put in Stockholm is the capital of. You can say Sweden, 42%. It's a bit worrying that Norway and Denmark are here, but it could be also the, and then it would continue with it with other things. And then we've got, uh, it does understand code as well. So if we say using system dot, we've got out, IO, call, Windows, thread, and it's bringing out all of this programming stuff if you're writing uh, C sharp uh, code. And then, yeah, we store our data in Azure. And then you've got things like SQL, storage, data, cloud, functions, web, and all kinds of uh, stuff, uh, stuff like that. And then, yeah, the king of rock and roll is Elvis. Uh, we've seen that Presley comes out there. If we feed in the king of rock and roll is Elvis Pres, you can see that Lee is 99.76% certain, and all of the other tokens are in that uh, area there. And the same with, uh, if we say Elvis cost, then LO is coming out after that one uh, there. Um, you can have stuff that's more ambiguous, something like my favorite, favorite pizza topping is, there's lots of different varieties on uh, that. And somewhere in here, they've got pineapple. Um, if we kind of look in this, yeah, pineapple 0.02%. And we can see if we move around this area, there's all kinds of different um, toppings coming out uh, here in that, uh, that section there. And then my favorite month is, you can see that it's split with mentioning the various months around, around here as well. So um, doing sequence uh, pr prediction using models, um, it's, we started out using recurrent neural networks for this. We'll talk about those a bit later on. We then moved on to LTSM, or long uh, short-term memory uh, models. And then we moved on to uh, transformers. Uh, just reading a question, how can these models become good at math? I've tried to add up to a sequence of numbers and it gives out incorrect results every time. It's the training process, the fact that these models are trained for a long time. Uh, basically, the neural networks are really good at, uh, at maths. But, oh yeah, uh, oh yeah, adding up a sequence of numbers. Yes, the models are not good at, uh, at maths and understanding mathematical uh, concepts. It is possible in Langchain to use uh, something called a Langchain agent. So you can use a calculator agent within uh, Langchain. And what it will then do is the language model will understand that if you're adding a sequence of numbers together, then it can use an external tool. And it uses the calculator tool and feeds in the numbers to the calculator and gets uh, gets the response back. So if you just um, go on YouTube and search for Langchain calculator agent, you'll probably see some demos on, uh, on how to use that. That's something that they are hopefully going to be improving in future in future models that it will be uh, better at doing mathematical uh, calculations. So but I'll run quickly through um, the recurrent neural networks. What they do is they have something called a hidden state and uh, they provide an output and these work sequentially. So as, as we feed in the, it sends an output with the most um, probable next token. It then updates the hidden state. And when we send in cat, as the next word, it uses that hidden state to calculate the next output. And that can be visualized if we unroll these uh, these networks. You can see that the hidden state is passed every time we feed in, uh, in a token. Yeah, chain of thought prompting also uh, helps. Yeah, 
you can work with with train of thought prompting as well whereby you ask it a question um i do this in my starcraft um youtube uh, starcraft demos i feed in um the statistics of the game and then ask it to come up with um, a kind of summary of the strategy and say based on this strategy summary recommend the um uh, the actual uh, outputs there is a hidden state different from a hidden layer yes um a hidden layer when you take one pass through the network they're just the, the neurons in between and once you've run through the network nothing changes in the actual network the values do not change but the hidden state means that the actual network is stateful it will maintain state in between feeding these uh, these words and that's one of the limitations of the um these uh are uh, um the rnn models is that they need to be we need to do back propagation through time and train based on the whole sequence that process is slow it also has sequential training and sequential um uh, processing of those words and also problems with vanishingly exploding gradients if you're into kind of the, the maths of how back propagation works they're not too too optimal also because of the hidden state uh, when you get long sequences very often it's forgotten uh, what happened at the beginning of the sequence so it may not understand what the cat is if you've gone through quite a long a long sequence in order to improve things, um, they have these LTSM, which stands for long short term memory. So the hidden state is really a short term memory. And what these models do is also have a long term memory, which is uh, continuously held and it's updated as we uh, as we actually pass through uh, the model. And that, that improves things. But um, we still have limitations of uh, sequential processing and, and training. So the GPT architecture uh, looks like this. Um, and as I mentioned, that's from the attention is all you need white paper. And as we zoom in on this, we can kind of see uh, what goes on in the, the actual model itself. So when we take the input, this is gonna be a sequence of tokens, which is done outside of the actual model. Uh, we do the tokenization. We then do the input embedding and we do positional encoding. The input embedding, is using vectors for the tokens and the positional encoding is using vectors for the actual position at which the tokens appear within uh, the, uh, the, the, the sequence. So what happens is we take the text input, the cat set on there, we do the tokenization to get the tokens uh, from that. We can then do the token embedding. And what this does is it uses a, a lookup um, to actually get the embedding vectors and each token will have its own embedding uh, vector. So there will be, um, you know, 50 something thousand of these different values and we just do a lookup uh, to get the actual embedding uh, for each, uh, each vector uh, that we'll get, we'll get there. Then we can do the positional vectors and the positional vectors is just um, constant for every sequence. It's like zero, one, two, three, four. And then we get these embeddings for position zero, one, two, three, four. We then uh, add those two together, and that gives us the encoder input values. So um, we can go into the model and we can see how this works. Um, I've actually got the source code for the um, transformers library on this, uh, this machine. So within the Python environment, in this environment, I'm using the um, transformers package down, down here somewhere, I think. Yeah, so you can basically do a pip install transformers and you'll get all of this uh, this stuff uh, that you can uh, work with. So what I can do is I can go to the um, next token prediction and um, I can actually uh, just hit F5 because I've got some breakpoints on that one. Sorry, I think that's the wrong one that I've got selected. I'll need to select next token prediction as the startup file and hit F5. And it will ask me to enter some text. So I'll do the cat set on there. And you can see here we've got the text, the cat set on there. And then when I go over that statement, that statement there, then we've got the actual input IDs. So you can see the input IDs are the tokens for the cat set on there. So we're using the tokenizer to encode the particular text. And we're asking it to return it as a, an actual uh, tensor. So that's coming back with it with a PyTorch uh, tensor there. This um, version of GPT-2 is written in, in PyTorch. Uh, if you've worked with that, um, you may uh, kind of understand a few of the classes. 
Then if I hit, then what we do is we do uh, outputs equals model and we just feed in the tokens. And the outputs is going to be, amongst other things, the probability of the next tokens, uh, which we'll see later on. So if I hit F5, I'm on the watch, I'm watching self, which is telling you what class we're in, which is the GP2 LM head model. And we're coming into the head model. If I hit F5 again, then we go into the GPT model. And what we're doing here, I think, if I step over this, um, yeah, I think I can actually run to the next break point. What we're doing is we're getting the actual position IDs. You can see that the position IDs aren't set to anything now. So if I uh, step over that line of code, you can see the position IDs are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So that's going to be uh, just for those actual uh, token values. If I hit F5 again, this is where we're going to do the embedding. So you can see that the input embeddings is currently empty. Uh, that's not equal to a value. So what we do here is we do input embeds is equal to self.wte. And if I have 12 on that, we can see that WTE, uh, this is for the token embedding, is just uh, an NN embedding uh, from PyTorch. And it's got the config vocab size, which is 50,000 and something, I think. Okay, we're, not, we're not at that point, but that's around about 50,000. Then, then we've got the position embedding, which is based on the max position size, which I think is about 1,024 or something like that. So if I go back to uh, where we were before, what we can do here, if I drop back to the watch window and just step over this code here, we've now set the input embeddings, uh, and you can see that the, that is just a whole load of... Um, load of floating point numbers. And the actual size of this, the dimensions is one, because we're kind of running one batch through the network, five, because there was five tokens in the input, and 768, because there's 768 values in the token embedding. We do the same thing with position embedding. So now the position embeddings has come up with one, five, seven, six, eight as well. And then we calculate the hidden states by adding the input embeddings to the position embeddings. So I'll leave that, uh, that break point there and we can drop back to the slides. So what we've done is we've just done this for all of uh, the words. We've got these kind of five by seven, six, eight uh, values there to get the encoder input values. The next thing we do is this multi-head attention, which is really the key to how these transformer models work. And this is the actual formula uh, that we're doing. We're working with a, a query, a key, and a value. And these are coming from the calculated from the input embeddings. And this is the actual formula uh, that we, we are performing. So what we do is we take the um, query, we multiply it by the key, we divide it by the square root of however many um, items we've got in here, which is 64. And then that will give us this attention uh, matrix here. We also perform a softmax operation to ensure that all of the rows and all of the columns add up to 1.0. And this matrix uh, for the tokens will have the word associate, association. It uses the positions and the meanings of the tokens to be able to say which tokens are connected to which uh, other tokens. There's a great website where you can actually visualize all of these, uh, these, uh, these layers. Uh, I can't remember the URL of it. It was mentioned in one of the, the YouTube videos. But when you feed in text, you can see all of the actual visualizations of what all of these um, these actually values mean. This is a real simplification because uh, the numbers are, are a lot larger than that. We then multiply this by the value and that gives us the attention at matrix, which is the meaning and the position and the relationship to other words. And that's used in the token prediction. So if I drop back to uh, Visual Studio and do F5 again, we're now in the GPT-2 block and we can drop into the attention block. And here we've got the hidden states, uh, which we're passing in. We can see that's the tensor, that's the size of the hidden states. And they use this um, attention, which is, I've not figured out exactly how the maths works, but this is a convolutional layer uh, that's set with uh, several uh, uh, several uh, weights. Um, so I've not really dug into the maths of it exactly how that, how that stuff works. But what that's gonna do is to take the hidden states, and if I go F10, it's going to work out the um, the query, the key, and the value. So if I drop into the watch window, you can see that those are currently the same size as the input vectors. Now, there's going to be a number of heads. If we drop back to the slide, 
and uh, go back to the diagram. It's a multi-head attention, meaning that there's going to be more than one head in the actual uh, attention uh, blocks. And you can see that the um, number of heads that we've got is 12. So what it's going to do is it's going to split the query key and the value into 12 separate arrays. So if I F10 over those three, you can see that these are changing from 15726 uh, to 112564. It's just um, rearranging the numbers in that actual uh, matrix. It's then going to get the actual uh, predictions from that for the next token. And if I run to the next uh, next breakpoint, actually, I think I need to disable a bunch of these uh, these breakpoints because it's going to do this for all of the 12 heads. So if I just keep running and disabling uh, breakpoints, we should get back to the original um, calling code. So we're in GPT model. Let's um, disable breakpoint on that and continue there. And this is where it's actually going to be uh, returning the code. We're in the GPT-2 head model, and this is the end of the uh, the actual prediction. If we go back to the um, the console application, here we're getting the next token logits. Um, so if I F10 over that, and we look at what this thing is, you can see that this is 1 by 50,257. So there are 50,257 uh, items uh, or tokens. And this is basically showing the probability of these tokens. If we actually look at what this thing uh, looks like, Okay. Oh, sorry, next token logits we haven't got. This is coming out with a, with a load of numbers uh, which represent the prob uh, the probability of the of the next token. There's a question. Just a big picture. Are we currently looking into the full process of LLM inference of the GPT two? Yes, yes. Uh, this is the GPT uh, two model from the Hugging Face Transformers using using PyTorch. That's uh, that's correct. And what we need to do to get the probabilities is to do a softmax operation on that. So if I do F10 on that, we get the next token probabilities, which is going to be 50,000 floating point numbers. Most of them are going to be very, very close to zero. But one of them will be about 7%, about 0 0.7, which will be the next token. So what we can do is we can use that to figure out um, the top k tokens so i think top k is 10 so if i go on that and we look at the top tokens um that's coming out uh, with the actual um token values for the um the top tokens so that was 0 0.76 so that's going to be floor i think there with uh, the um 76 percent uh sorry 0.76% chance. Then we can figure out the top words. If I go over that and we look in there, I just want that line there, top words. You can see we got floor bed couch and we've got the probabilities of those at those words there. So what that's basically doing is giving us the next token prediction. So yeah, I've got about 13 minutes left, so uh, I think um, uh, I'm okay for time. Now, if I run this thing without debugging, I'll just do a control F5. We can do the same thing without hitting all of these, these breakpoints. So the cut on there, and press enter, you can see it's saying floor, and I can just press enter and predict the next tokens so the cat sat on the floor and the cat was still asleep and when i press enter we're just taking the most probable token i'm sorry i'm sorry she said i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry what we can see if we just take the most probable token it gets stuck in this loop where it keeps repeating itself now this is what the model does but in order to generate more meaningful text we've got to think about um maybe having uh, randomness and choosing some of the other tokens. So if I choose um, uh, seven, for example, it will say that um, was um, really. We've got all of these. Uh, yeah, we can say that was really nice. And then it can continue with Things, things like that. And so by kind of generating a mixture 
uh, of different tokens in the output, you can generate something that's a bit more meaningful. So another example of that, there's two parameters that we can use. I think I might have to jump around in the slide deck a bit uh, to find those at those slides. But um, there's a couple of parameters we can use when we're working with the language uh, models. Uh, one of them is going to be the temperature. And one of them is going to be the uh, top K. So if you look at um, temperature, for example, if I just select the, uh, the temperature slide. I'll always, always down to it, actually. Um, the temperature is used uh, as a way of being able to generate more random outputs from the language model. And we can either use the temperature or we can use the top P. And the top P is saying, well, how much, how many of these words should we actually consider? If you use a low top P value, it's only going to choose common words. If you increase the top P value, it's going to choose uh, more uh, different words. So in order to do that, uh, if I set this one as the startup file and do a control F5, So I do the cat sat on the. So this is with a, a top P of zero. So it's only choosing the most common word. You can see that only the most common one is appearing uh, there uh, in, in that sequence. However, we can change the value of top P. So if I stop this and then we set top P to 0 0.5, on the demo again. The cat sat on there. And you can see now there's a lot more um, words to choose from. So it's now coming up with more creative text as we're using um, a different value for top B. Okay, it does seem to be repeating a bit uh, there. Another thing that we can do, uh, as well as just uh, varying those values, is to consider the concept of beams. So basically, uh, I skipped over those slides, but basically a beam is a sequence of uh, tokens or a sequence of words. It's um, kind of a, a theory for being able to go in and, and query um, the... Um, the, these kind of tree-like structures. So you can see for the cat sat on the, you could have floor, bed, or couch. And then for each of those words, you could uh, start predicting the next tokens on those. And as, as we do that, we can go in and do a beam uh, prediction. So when you're working and calling these models, if you're working with GPT-2, you can actually configure the number of beams. And by understanding kind of various other output combinations, it can choose combinations of these uh, tokens or words that are going to be uh, more uh, creative. So that's used, used a lot within these, uh, these language models working, uh, working with, uh, with uh, beams. Um, I think I did have a quick demo on the beam theory. Uh, if I go to the beam search theory, set that guy as a startup file and hit control F5. What this is now going to do is to do a beam search for, I think it's the cat sat on there. And what it's doing is looking at different um, kinds of words and putting a score on those words about how uh, common uh, common they should be. And then it's going to be able to generate better text if we are working at, with those, uh, those beams. Another thing that we can use is the temperature for this. So if I set this temperature theory as a startup file, what I'm going to do here is call a model with different uh, temperatures. So when we go over as a temperature of uh, zero, I'm just saying my favorite animal is the, it's always coming out with the same results. And if we go for 0 0.1, you can see that the results do start to vary. 0 0.2, it's choosing other things than dogs, it's choosing elephants. And as the temperature is being increased, it's going to come out with more uh, creative words. I'm quite worried about this. I've done this twice at conferences, and the whole audience has fallen about laughing because of something that has come out of um, the uh, the actual uh, language model. So maybe I'm not going to go too far down those temperatures if this is on uh, a live stream and it's being recorded. Um, 
so that's basically how the the temperature uh, theory works and how temperature can affect uh, the output we can we can look at those those values other parameters that we use if i just drop back to the slides we've got temperature we've got top p uh, you can also specify how many completions to generate uh, you can specify a stop sequence you can specify a maximum number of tokens then you've got uh, this presence penalty and uh, frequency penalty. If you remember when I was using a low temperature, it just came, kept coming out with the same stuff. So what we can do is say um, increasing the frequency penalty, and then it's going to be less repetitive at generating text. If you're gener generating a song or a poem, you may want the frequency penalty to be fairly low because groups of words are very often repeated over and over again in a song or in a poem. Whereas uh, if you're writing a report, you don't want to have that uh, those kinds of uh, repetitions of those uh, various uh, groups and words. You can also set biases for certain tokens appearing in the completion. So modifying the likelihood of specific tokens appearing if you want to be able to uh, do, uh, uh, do, uh, uh, do that. There is also, you can block tokens if you feel some tokens are inappropriate you can block them uh, from coming into the uh, into the uh, output okay so um that's pretty much what i was going to talk about with relate relating to the um the gpt models is there any uh, questions uh, that we've uh, uh, we've got i'm happy to take questions for a few minutes uh, for the, uh, the last section yes uh um i saw alan you had been taking a couple of questions in between yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm going to start from the top. We have a question from Fusion. Are languages with grammatical cases producing more tokens because of additional complexity? Yeah, I'm not sure about the grammatical ordering of the tokens. Um, I think the more, the more tokens are generated because I think I can bring up that slide again because the actual tokenization is based on specific combinations of characters. And um, it seems to be quite biased on the English language. If we look at um, English, you can see that the actual tokens are pretty much single words. Whereas if you go for something like um, Swedish, you can see that the Swedish words aren't too prevalent in the tokenization uh, uh, language. So something like understand Yeah, we've got understand there being as one token, but if you look at the Swedish word for understand, it's one, two, three, four, five tokens, um, because the, the, the tokenization language is, is based on English. With the GPT SWE model, the tokenization is based on the Swedish language, so that is then more efficient uh, with the, um, the, the tokenization. Is it possible to share the demo code on GitHub repo? Um, eventually, maybe. Um, I'm terribly lazy at putting stuff stuff out on a, on a GitHub, but I do plan to record this as a webcast, and uh, then uh, I will see if I can get the code up on on a GitHub. You can actually download the uh, the Transformers model code and experiment with it with, with this with yourself. It's it's fairly easy. It's not too many lines of code uh, to actually code against the um, uh, the uh, Transformer package that's that's available. Yeah. How can these models become good at math? I've tried to add up a sequence of numbers and it gives out incorrect results every time. Yeah, um, they're, they're not very good at maths. Um, they're not very good at reasoning. Um, I was in, when I was in Belgium, they sell these like 75 centiliter bottles of beer, uh, really big um, beer bottles, about as big as a bottle of wine. So I asked GPT um, how many of those I can fit in a 30 liter backpack and it calculated 40. Um, and what it's doing is it's taking the volume of beer and the volume of the backpack and then doing this this division. Uh, I think you can get about six bottles of those beer in, in a 30 litre backpack, but it wasn't actually understanding that um, the volume of the bottles is going to take up a lot of space and it wasn't reasoning that correctly. So I think there is going to be uh, work that's going to be done to make them better at maths. Um, as I mentioned, uh, with Langchain, there is a calculator agent. So um, what the language model will do is it will understand that it's performing a sum and it will feed that sum off to the calculator uh, agent. And there's probably um, a bunch of videos on YouTube about uh, about doing this. I'll just uh, have a quick check on this and see, and see if I can find anything.
Yeah, I couldn't find anything on the actual calculator agent, but you can use Langchain agents, and there is a calculator agent available, um, which will be able to do sums for you. Um, so it's possible to make them better at math through using external agents. Is hidden state different than a hidden layer? Yeah, yeah, I think I, I mentioned that, that the, uh, the the hidden layer is the actual neurons um, in uh, a neural network that we don't see. We see the input and the output, then there's all of these kind of hidden layers in between. And the hidden state is the um, a vector which has all of the various numbers, and that state is, is kind of preserved and modified as it, as it runs through uh, the question. We're currently looking into the full process of LLM interference uh inference of gpt2 yeah. yeah i mentioned that, that that was correct yeah yeah and i think the same person asks one step i haven't understood in our example the cat sat on the we have the as the last word which using attention is most closely connected to sat and cat how's the word predicted with this I'm not sure on that one. Um, not sure what that was referring to. Oh, actually, usually yeah, the, because when, when I showed the numbers in in the slide, um, they weren't really actually purely calculated. Uh, I just built up that slide banging in numbers, so it may be a bit incorrect. Um, I think that there was a slide that I, I showed on that whereby it had numbers present for the uh, the attention, and I hadn't actually got the the true calculations of those numbers. So it's kind of a long way down in the slide deck. Probably easier if I just um, let's see if I can find that slide. Yeah, I think it was this one here. Um, I hadn't actually done the, the, the full calculations of these, uh, these actual values. So these are, are probably uh, probably incorrect. Yeah, I think there was, there was another question that came in um, just uh, just recently. If we can uh, check that one out, um, is continuous learning anywhere? Near yeah. regarding this current talk. I'm not sure about the continuous learning. I've not heard of that that one. Yeah, uh, the step between the attention calculation and the final uh, word uh, word prediction. Yeah, um, I'm kind of digging through this theory at the moment, and that's what I haven't um, fully uh, fully figured out yet. As I mentioned, this presentation tends to get a bit deeper every time I deliver the presentation. Uh, what I intend to do when I've um, you know, fully figured out, figured out everything and can explain it in, in an understandable way is to record it as a video and, and drop it on my YouTube channel. So I should be able to um, come out with the answer uh, once I've uh, figured that out. Um, so hopefully in a, in a few months, it should be out on my YouTube channel. I think that's all the questions we had. Yeah. Great. Thanks for tuning in. It's been uh, it's been good, been good to um, to to uh, run through this again. And hopefully, I will be I'll de be delivering this at conferences a bit later on. So I will drop it in my YouTube um, channel if it is recorded as as a conference uh, presentation. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Alan. And we hope to see you again soon. Um, yeah. 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 Great. Thanks for that. All right.